Okay, um, let's continue. Uh, just a reminder, don't forget to sign up and vote for the lightning talk. There's a whiteboard down in the lobby. And we'll continue with a talk by Eduardo Hapkot from Red Hat's KVM team. And he's going to speak about KVM and CPU features. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, my name is Eduardo, I work for the KVM team. Uh, mostly on PLM code and especially on CPU in the moment stuff. Um, so just first, uh, what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to explain some basic concepts so people know uh, what I'm talking about. Then I'm going to talk about what exists today, what are the challenges today, what are the issues. Then I should talk about what we are doing for the future today regarding CPU enablement. So first for the basic so concepts. Uh, this is a very simplified model of how things work uh, on KVM. So the most, don't worry about the details here, but the most important part are the three software layers we have, is that we have the kernel code with KVM, we have QEMO, and we have the management system. Uh, especially, uh, I'm going to focus on management systems that use Libvirt. And one thing I'm going to mention a lot is the way Libvirt talks to QEMO. That means the command, QEMO command line and the monitor that uses the QMP protocol to talk to, to QEMO. So another concept I'll talk about a lot is the stable guest API. What does that mean? Uh, it's something Paulo mentioned, is that you don't want to make the virtual machine change under the guest. And sometimes you simply can't do that. Sometimes you want to avoid that. So basically what we want is if you change the host, if you change the host hardware, if you change the host software, uh, or you move your VM to a different host, you want to the VM to look the same for the guest. Uh, that's a requirement for live migration because you simply can't change the hardware when on your migration. And it's something you most normally want even if you're not using live migration. Uh, another thing uh, most people probably know about is the CPU ID instruction in x86. I'm going to focus on x86 here. And that's basically the way the CPU uh, presents the software, uh, which features are available, uh, other information about the CPU, uh, other more complex da data. And one thing to keep in mind is that the CPU ID data is part of the ABI you expose to the guest. I mean, we can't simply change that suddenly uh, under the guest. So let's talk about the mechanisms we, we have today. First, uh, the way CPU ID is handled on KVM today uh, is that the QEMO is going to control it, how, how it does that. So when you are going to start a VM, QEMO is going to ask KVM, ask the kernel, the kernel code, and KVM code the kernel, uh, what are the supported features on the current host. That means hardware capabilities, with that, and that means KVM capabilities, what's supported by, the, by KVM and the host so that it can be enabled. After that, QEMO is going to ask KVM to build a CPU ID table with all the data that's going to be exposed. Uh, it's supposed to be a gray box here with the kernel. Uh, and that table is that what's used uh, when the guest is going to issue a CPU ID instruction. So how KVM works is, th is that the guest code is going to run on the CPU, but when some instructions are issued, special instructions, uh, KVM is going to inter intercept that and CPU ID is one of them. So when you are running on a virtual machine, like uh, how, m how many of you were uh, saw Karen's talk about KVM? How many were not on that talk? So, okay. <laughs> so uh, when the guest is asking for information about the CPU, it's going to see only what QEMO set up, not what you have on the real CPU. You are going to see a virtual CPU, and that's completely controlled by QEMO. Uh, so what, what, 
how do that end up when you see the whole stack? What happens is what the lower layers are going to affect what you can enable. So when you get a new CPU uh, and it has lots of new features and you want to uh, uh, allow your virtual machine to use them, you, you need the lower layers to cooperate that on that. You don't just need support on the hardware, but you just you need support on KVM to allow those features to be enabled, and you just need support on CMU to understand that this feature can be enabled. On the other hand, we want the upper layers to decide what's going to be enabled, because the upper layers know uh, how the VM is going to be configured, how, what, how, what the user wants. Uh, and mostly that means when you have a new CPU and you have new features, you can simply enable that uh, automatically, suddenly, because first reason is that you're going to break the ABI. Uh, uh, that means you could have a VM that is running and then you move to a new host or you upgraded your host and suddenly it has a new feature and you didn't expect that. And the second reason is that you, if you create a, you have a, a host with a very new CPU, you create a VM and you want to be able to migrate them. If it has lots of features that are not supported on all your other machine, you may find out at the last moment that you can mi can't migrate it. So that's why you don't have the best behavior by default uh, on the lower layers of the system. You, we can't just enable everything. Um, so what are the mechanisms we use to make sure that happens on CMU? Uh, the first mechanism is the CPU module table. So that explains the difference uh, of the, what Karen has, has shown about the difference between a Sandy Bridge host and what you see when you ask KVM to see a uh, Sandy Bridge CPU. When you ask KVM to show a Sandy Bridge CPU, you are going to see what's inside the, ta the table in QEMO saying what a Sandy Bridge looks like. And you can also uh, control individual features on the QEMO command line. And to keep compatibility, we have a mechanism called machine type. So we want to be able to change the CPU module table. We want to be able, for example, sometimes we, when we define the same bridge machine, KVM didn't support a few features, then it starts supporting it, and we want to, to add it. When we add it, we keep the old machine types with the old values. So in practice, that means if you use the same machine type and the same CPU model, you're going to get exactly the same result. So that's something you want to pay attention when you are going to get uh, a VM running, is that you are not going to see new stuff even if you upgrade your kernel, if you upgrade your CPU, unless you are changing the configuration of your VM. And there's a, another mechanism on QEMU I'm going to talk about later, that's the import flag. That makes sure that QEMU won't start a VM if it does not, uh, if the host does not have everything that you need. And it's required to enable that flag if you want to make sure your results are predictable. Otherwise, if the host does not support a feature, it's going to be suddenly, uh, silently disabled, and you normally don't want that. <coughs> uh, I'm, am I too fast, or? So, and continuing what Karen has shown, we have a special CPU model. So maybe many of you here just want your VMs to get all the latest feature, e features, everything you want. You don't care, if you don't care about migration, you don't care about making the VM always the same every time, even after, after you upgrade. We, you have something for you. That's the whole CPU model. That on libvirt is called host pass through. What does that mean? It that mean uh, CPU host means that you are going to get everything that's supported by the host, not just by the host hardware, but by the host hardware and KVM and exposed to the guest. And for people that are going to use this CPU model, maybe the rest of the presentation is going to be a little boring because I'm going to talk about the mechanism to make sure we don't have the issues that we are going to have with CPU host. Uh, so, if you just want everything, 
you you can use this HPO model and you should be happier. Uh, it's sometime it's easier to get something that breaks because when you add a new feature to the kernel, you are not going to see people mo many people using it until QM starts using it. But if you use CPU host, it's going to be enabled automatically. So you may get more surprises, but you may get more stuff, more nice stuff enabled. Uh, considering all those mechanisms, we have a few requirements we need to expose to, to manage management systems. So the first requirement is that libvirt and the management system that use libvirt needs to make sure that all the CPID data you are going to expose to get is what you asked for, is what you expected. So if the user chose a CPU model, if the user chose a few set of CPU features, we need to make sure that this is what you're going to get. The second requirement is something that we need the management system to know what you really can run on that host. That means you need to know if a CPU model can really be enabled on your machine. You, you want to know if a specific feature can be enabled if you want to enable it. And you also, also on the last item, uh, you want to know that not just when creating a new VM, but when migrating. So that may apply for many different scenarios depending on, on, on your management system. That may apply, for example, if you are using Vert Manager on desktop, you just want to know if that CPU model can run on, on your desktop. If you are running Overt or OpenStack and you have lots of hosts, you probably want to know if the VM w you are creating can be migrating to, to any of, of the hosts you, you you have, so that's something we need to be able to expose to the management system. So now to the sad stuff, what are the challenges and issues we have today, uh, considering the whole stack? So back to the same dilemma we have before. Uh, the first problem we have today with the whole stack, including Libvirt, is that QM has the CPU, CPU model table and Livert has basically a copy of that. And they may even disagree sometimes, but Livert does not consider that QM may have a different understanding of what SandyBridge means, of what Mayhalen means. And that may lead to issues. For example, if Livert assumes that a given feature is already present on a CPU model and QM doesn't, Libvirt is not going to be to ask that feature to be explicitly enabled, and it, you are going to get different results from what you expected. Most of that is QM's fault. I mean, QM does not expose any API that good API to let Libvirt know what's really available on each CPU model. So Libvirt had to duplicate that, and that caused issues today. The second and most serious problem is that Libvirt today does not use enforce mode. So enforce mode is the is the what makes sure that exactly everything you are asking QM to expose is going to be visible to the guests. So if Libvirt is asking features X, Y, and Z to be enabled, uh, and you don't use the enforce flag, and the whole CPU does not support everything. KVM does not support everything. The features are, are simply going to be silent disabled. And that's the worst problem we have today. It's not so bad because Livert does, does make a few checks before starting the VM. I'm going to talk that, uh, so about that soon. But it's serious because we have more complex features today that are not being detected properly by, by Libvirt. And this also is related to the APIs QM exposed to Libvirt, to QMP and command line, to make that, to make the enforce mode easy to use and safer to use by Libvirt. Uh, third problem we have today is that it's related to enforce mode problem is that Libvirt is simply querying the host CPU directly 
when checking what the host supports. So it simply assumes that if uh, some features is on proc CPU info uh, on the host, on CPU ID data on the host, it can be virtualized and it can be enabled. Uh, and that's not, not always true. So that solves partially the problem of not using it in force mode because most features can be detected as missing that way, but that's not what we want. And again, that's QM's fault because we don't have a proper interface allow that to allow that to happen because uh, the only interface we have makes QM abort if all, most all, not all features are visible. And uh, we are working to, to improve that as well. That's for the same reason that Livert's not using that today. If we do that, we risk breaking setups that are working today. That, that's the main problem for Livert and QM when we, we are going to fix that. Is that uh, sometimes a feature is being silent, disabled, but the user is happy with the results and the VM is running. If you suddenly start using the flag every time, you'll get a VM that was working and it said it is not going to start. Sorry? Yeah, bug com yeah, it's bug compatibility. So that's a problem Libvirt we need to handle is that we need to choose wisely when it's safe to use the enforce mode and when you may want to keep bug compatibility. Yeah. So what are we working today to address all those issues? Uh, first for the existing interface we have today are basically CPU specific command line options and monitor command. We have options to configure the CPU. We have commands to add CPU to implement CPU hot plug that Kevin mentioned. We have a few commands to ask about CPU information, but all those interfaces are very limited. They don't provide all the information Libvirt needs and there are some interfaces that not, are not real interfaces. For example, in force mode, just make QM abort and does not report what's missing. It, it reports, but in human readable form. Uh, so the plan today, what we are working today is to use common infrastructure in, in QM to implement those new interfaces and expose additional information. And that's where QDEV and QOM enter. Uh, so just explaining what, what QDEV and QOM are. QDEV is the internal model of, uh, internal device model inside QMO. That's basically how QMO handles all kinds of devices, common stuff that involves adding devices, removing devices, configuring them. And it's built on top of another part of the infrastructure that's QOM, that's a more generic object model that allow, allows you to handle objects, create objects, set properties, query information, list. Uh, you have a, an object tree inside QMO, and that's really generic. You don't, uh, there are basic generic commands to handle them. You don't have specific, you don't need specific commands for each kind of device you have. You just need to know the property name and the dev device name. And this is what we are going to use to help solve the problem. Uh, so what we have today is that CPU, the CPU codes were changed to use the QDEV infrastructure. So we are using the QDEV infrastructure to make CPUs look like devices in the code. We add a few properties to, the, to those devices to allow Libvirt to query that, that information. So we have information about the feature, uh, we call feature word because that's basically how the feature flags look like on the CPU ID data. It's just a set of uh, words, I, I mean 32-bit bit words that query lot one bit for each feature. feature. We have an additional uh, property that is going to be used to emulate in force mode that will allow Libvirt to know that a feature was disabled. 
but it's not being used by the system yet. Uh, it's recent. And the main reason is because what we have missing. Uh, so the main problem today is that those interfaces are not very, um, it's not they are not very good to be used when you want to query lots of information about each CPU model because you need to restart QAMO with a different CPU model, query for information, start CPU, QAMO again, query for information for the other CPU model. And that's not reasonable, reasonable for Libvirt. Every time you start it, you start the Libvirt daemon to run QAMO multiple times. We still need some mechanism to expose machine type specific data for Libvirt. So if a CPU model cha has changed, on a machine type and you are going to keep compatibility. Libvirt will need to query that information. It's not available yet. Uh, and we are planning to add Q uh, QM object model properties for all the features. So it makes it easier to query the feature information. So the, the previous solution uh, is a bit low level and we're trying to make it more structured and easier to use. And of course, what's missing is that after we do that, we need to make Libvirt use all the new stuff. So the main reason we, going back to the other slide we had about the stack, uh, we need to work on all kinds of infrastructure on the lower layers to make sure information gets to the upper layers where decisions are taken. So we can just enable stuff in QM and hope it works. We need to expose all that information to the top because Libvirt allows the user to enable individual features. Libvirt allows the user to choose a CPU model. So we need to expose all that information and let the policy and let the decisions to be taken uh, on the upper layers. Uh, after we do that, we have a, a few longer term plans. So we want to use the new infrastructure in QMO, the generic object infrastructure to deal with CPU devices and just not need to use CPU specific uh, stuff. Again, it's a long term plan. It may take a while, but we can do that. And another thing that's related to that is uh, something I didn't talk too much is about CPU topology. So when Kerry was talking about Sorry for the people who didn't see the, the talk, but uh, about the CPU, the list of CPUs you have. Basically, you you can expose a different topology of CPU cores and CPU threads for for the guest. So you may have a uh, eight core CPU on your host, and you may choose to expose a four core CPU uh, to your guest or something like that. And there are no good interface to make that work. And to make, uh, we you can configure that, but we need to make that work with CPU hot plug. We need to make that work when you are exposing a new uh, virtual machine to the guest. So we need good interface to address that, and it's probably going to use the common QDEV in, uh, infrastructure as well. Um, so that's basically what we are working on. Uh, do you have questions about? what we are working right now. Yeah. Yeah, it may change, yes. Sorry? Mm. So repeating the question. Uh, so if you change the topology exposed to get, it may affect the function. Yes, it can affect, sorry? Yeah, um, even if you keep the same number of the CPU threads or, or and so on. Yes, it may because if you expose a different topology to the guest, you are basically just changing a few CPU ID bits. You're not changing anything else. But those CPU ID bits may make the guest software behave differently. So, for example, the guest kernel may decide to keep uh, pro process in the same core because it knows it's easier to migrate within the same core. Or if you expose an, a NUMA topology, that's also just a table, just a table saying that this region of memory is on a node, these CPUs are on a NUMA node. Uh, it's, it's going to affect how the gas behaves and that may affect performance. Yeah, basically the scheduler is going to behave differently. 
And if you're using Numa in a hacky scheduler or other software in the, in the, in the guest, just try to allocate them and be consistent. But you also need to be careful because it will expose uh, specific topology and it has nothing to do with the host topology uh, because virtual CPUs may run on any CPU on the host. So if you want to expose a more complex topology, you need to make sure that it makes sense. And you are not having two vCPUs that look like hyper threads, but running on completely separate CPUs on the host, then you are not going to get the performance you gain. So it may change performance for the bad or for be better or for the worse. So you need to be careful about that. And what we miss right now is just a way to configure that properly. And after that, we may work on tools to make the make sure we get the best performance on specific workloads. And after we do all this, uh, we may have some benefits, longer term benefits that uh, would affect management systems. So for example, today, most management systems, uh, for example, Overt, you have to define migration, uh, they call migration domains. That's basically a cluster of hosts that you know that any VM on that list set of hosts should be able to migrate to all hosts. So you are forced to define that. And when you define that, they use that uh, to decide if it's possible to migrate on or not. And if Libvirt should expose that information to the management systems and information about what the host can really do, it's more reliably. You could try more VC stuff and make that based on CPU features and not just CPU models and make it happen automatically or maybe affect usability. I mean, if you create a new VM and you know all your hosts are of a given type of CPUs, you can just to suggest it as a default to use the best CPU model you can. That's something that's not possible today uh, without those good interfaces you need to implement. And this will require changing, probably, probably will require changing the APIs exposed by Libvirt as well. So right now we are working on the lower layers between QEMU and Libvirt to make this work, to make Libvirt get all the information it needs and after that, we may extend that and make the higher layers smarter and more reliable and use that information. So I don't know how much time we have. Okay, uh, more questions? Uh, thank you, and more questions? So he asked, if you don't use the CPU option on QME, what we are going to get? You just don't get the default CPU model that's named QME64 on x86-64 and QME32 on 32-bit uh, builds of QME. So that's, you just get the defo uh, default CPU model. It's very conservative. So it does not have lots of new features because you know you don't want uh, by default get something that may not run. Uh, if you, you get a two new feature, I mean feature that's present on just very new CPUs and you enable it by default, you're going to get a VM that can be started. So it's very conservative, the default. I don't remember, uh, it's going to use the default, but I don't remember if Libvirt has its own default or if it is just relying on QM's default. But if Libvirt has its own default, I, I think it's exac exactly the same uh, as QM. I, I think it's using QM64 as the default. Uh, so I, I don't remember the de details on that case, but I think Libvirt is normally explicit, but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's yeah, that, that good, uh, good question. It depends on, uh, sorry, repeat the question again. <laughs> so it has to, if, if it's worth having all the, those new features enabled, all new, those new features in available in the feature model. So it, it's a good question and it really depends on workload. I mean, sometimes you just get the CPU and it's this faster and it has new features and you may get benefits from the new CPU even without exposing the new specific instruction set features to the, to the CPU. On the other hand, uh, CPU vendors uh, um, uh, put those new features and they sell that them, they use that as benefit from on the new CPUs and people sometimes expect them to be available. So we try to work to make them available, but uh, I can mention specific examples where it was really make, uh, making a big difference. I'm working more on infrastructure to make that possible to enable the new stuff but I don't have numbers on the specific features that make a huge difference or not uh, on virtual machines. And some features are not about performance. I mean, sometimes you have really new things you can do with the, with the CPU. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, normally, normally the work starts on the kernel side, I mean, Normally, we, when you have new CPU features, the first part that needs to be touched is the kernel code. So basically, we are just enabling uh, things that are already available in the kernel code uh, on QM. And most of the work, the more complex work, is on the kernel side. So there's basically no reason to not add C new CPU models if the features are already there because it's basically changing a table, ad adding a new table entry on QM. So What's complex on QM is to specify all those interfaces we need to expose to libvirt, and what's taking a long time is to get the uh, design that the maintainers can agree on, so we can expose that. Because once you add a new interface, it's hard to change it, or it's hard to drop a bad interface if you find out it's bad. But adding new features, it's fairly easy. You just add a new table, a new entry to to a table, and uh, that's it because mo the most complex part on the kernel side, or sometimes it's not complex even on the kernel. Some features to be enabled by KVM just need KVM just need to know that they can be enabled because the CPU handles everything. Sometimes you need to virtualize lots of stuff. Sometimes you need to handle lots of details on the KVM side because the CPU does not virtualize everything. So it depends on the feature. But on QM is generally simp simple. Generally, it's just about adding an entry to a table. And we also have cases where the, uh, I didn't mention that, but uh, we have cases where a feature is not a CPU hardware feature, but it's a feature that's supported by KVM even without the hardware feature. The main example, uh, example we have is X280. That's an extension to the Intel controller uh, that allow that's more efficient for virtual machines. It's also more efficient, uh, and it's completely emulated by KVM. But even being completely emulated, it's it has better results. So it's good to have that enabled, even if the host hardware does not have it. So it does not always mean uh, using new features on the whole hardware, but new features on KVM itself. Any more questions? Okay, so I have a few minutes. I, I was worried about the time, and I think I just went too, f too fast worrying about not finishing in time. Okay, thank you very much.